Hey guys, Quiff the Lazy Geek here and welcome back to the channel. Today we are going to talk about the ZWC Star S50 Smart Telescope. This is a telescope that is a smartphone controlled on the smartphone app. You can choose which target, uh, typically the nebulae, galaxy, that kind of stuff that you want the telescope to point to and the telescope will like automatically point to that target, center the target in the field of view, take pictures of it, accumulate those pictures, basically accumulating light on the target, and then show you the result. It's pretty amazing, it works really well, and even from here in Tokyo, which is a super light polluted city, so obviously really not adapted to uh, astrophotography and astronomy in general, it got really good results. Uh, if you're interested in my first light and first impressions with this uh, smart telescope, I've done a video on that. I'll put the link up above, also down in the description and in the pinned comments. Also, I'll put links to the telescope page directly if you want to have a deeper look at the specs or if you want to purchase it. So in this video, I am going to address a lot of the questions that I received. In my previous first impressions video, I got a ton of comments, a ton of questions, and this is awesome. I love this. I love when people are geeking out about astronomy and astrophotography because, as the channel name implies, I am a huge geek, albeit a lazy one. So the questions range from things like how big is the case, what are the dimensions, that kind of stuff, to more interesting and almost philosophical questions about like, is this a toy? Our tool are things like are the images that it takes fake are they just downloaded from the internet and it just pretends to be taking the images so we're going to answer that today and let's start with that last question i mentioned about whether the images that this tele telescope takes are fake and this is very interesting because i know where this is coming from this is coming from the samsung uh smartphone moon pictures where Samsung was doing some weird AI stuff based on the picture that you took of the moon, but like enhancing it more than it should be able to enhance. So really, I got the question like, is this thing doing the same thing? And what is really cool is that even though I was taking those pictures during my first impression from here in Tokyo, so they're definitely not the best that you can get and much worse than what you would get in an American suburban town, for instance, people are still asking the question, which means that they think the pictures being shown are downloaded direct from the internet, which is really high praise for this telescope if you're thinking it's doing that. So just to be completely sure that it's not doing this, I did several tests. I used this telescope on windy nights when I would expect to see some star trailing. Uh, I did see star trailing and the stacking when it tries to accumulate the exposures uh, together didn't work well because it was rejecting too many of the small short exposures that it was taking because of the wind. Same result if I, if I were to just like poke at it. I also did an additional test where I pointed it at the target obscured by some clouds. And yes, the clouds did make it into the final stack as well. I also tried putting a filter on front of the telescope, so using this with uh, other filters. And uh, my results were very interesting, but they were definitely affected by the filter as well. So if it is using some weird machine learning to enhance the pictures uh, by downloading pictures from the internet or having an internal database of those pictures that it applies automatically, it's doing a really, really good job at being sneaky about it. And I have over 10 years of experience in astrophotography, and I can tell the noise patterns getting better and better as you stack the pictures. It's, it looks very natural. It looks exactly what I would expect uh, a stacking, a light accumulation to be going from the noise patterns to the in enhancement in signal to noise ratio with the diminishing returns. Everything is in line with proper light accumulation. Another frequent question that I got was, is this a toy or a tool? It was not really a question. It was more a statement by a lot of people that this is a toy or this is a kid's toy, which I find so dismissive. Heck, a, vi a normal big telescope is also just a toy. We're having fun, like pointing it at the sky and looking at the results. And this is no different. This gets amazing results. And because it is using an internal camera and accumulating light thanks to the camera, you can see more targets and better and with color and with details with this little tiny thing than you can with even a six inch or eight inch massive Schmidt Cassegrain telescope with GoTo as long as you don't fit a camera onto it. And because it saves the final image uh, both as a normal kind of JPEG, but also as a FIT file, which is a raw file format specifically for astrophotography, 
photography, you can process the, those images yourself in the end using astrophotography dedicated software, which to me brings this squarely into the realm of, yes, it is a toy. Yes, I am I'm having a lot of fun with it, but at the same time, it is a tool. And just like another smart telescope that I featured on the channel before, the Dwarf Lab Dwarf 2, I feel like this is a great telescope to be able to take on the move with you when you don't want to take like a big telescope around to take uh, to take images. This is just like grab and go. It's just going to work. You're going to control it via smartphone. And then in the end, you can process those pictures in astrophotography processing software. And the, the big, biggest reason for me that this is a tool is that especially for city dwell dwellers like me, I can use this as a tool to do astrophotography from darker zones, even zones that I can only go to by train without having to, you know, bring a lot of equipment. So that's a tool. It's definitely a tool. Get images from dark locations. Anyway, that's my point of view. And thank you for everyone to express their opinion on, on this. And I completely understand where you're coming from when you're saying it's a toy. I argue that it is more and it is a bit dismissive to just call it a toy. And it's also dismissive of buyers and potential buyers and users of this as well. So yeah, maybe not. Okay, another question that I had is our remark is this thing will die because of dew. Because yes, there is an objective lens here. There's a 50 millimeters diameter objective lens. And it is glass. Glass will cool down faster than the surrounding air, which means that dew will form on it, will have a film of dew, and we cannot take images anymore. The good news is that there is an integrated dew heater within uh, the telescope. It will use up more battery, but it is available and you can use it to have the lens warmed up. Uh, Tokyo has been exceptionally hot and humid uh, this summer, and I haven't had any dew issues at this stage even though my main equipment, which is under this thing here, did suffer from dew issues. Another common question that I had was like, how do you get files off of this? So there are actually two ways. Uh, you can share the files using a ZW account. I don't really like that. I wish we could share to Facebook, Instagram, Gmail using the, the smartphone share feature. Hopefully this is something that will get implemented. Or you can connect the telescope. There is a USB-C port. Connect the telescope to a computer via the USB-C port. Turn it on, it has to be turned on, and once it is turned on, the uh, computer will recognize it as a mass storage device, just like any other uh, USB stick, for instance. And you'll be able to download files from it, delete them, etc. You can also view your images and delete those images directly from the uh, smartphone app. Another question that I had, which is more coming from experienced astrophotographers, is does this telescope do a dithering? And to understand what dithering is, uh, you need to understand how this telescope works. This telescope works by once it has pointed itself to uh, a nebula or a galaxy or a star cluster that it wants to image, it will track it very precisely. And at the same time, it will take a series of 10 second exposures, which it, it keeps stacking on top of one another. Dithering is when in between those 10 second exposures, you smooth the telescope slightly very slightly by a few pixels worth and this helps actually average out fixed noise patterns and make the whole image and the background noise smoother and yes this telescope does dithering i don't know if it does it every single frame but it does do dithering which is really good it does have the uh, side effect that there is a bit of uh, stacking or imaging overhead because of the dithering and because of the processing it does to stack the image on, uh, on top of each other, there is a gap, a time interval between the moment it stops taking one 10 second, second exposure and the moment it starts taking a new one. And so there's overhead there, time wasted, not imaging, which is somewhat significant, but because it is, uh, I believe, mostly due to dithering, it is worth it. And another question was, can you see individual subframes? on this telescope. So individual sub subframes refer to the uh, indiv individual 10 second exposures that the telescope takes once it has pointed to a target. It takes all of those exposures and stacks them on top of one another to accumulate the light. Can you see single 10 second exposures? The uh, answer for now is no. I don't know if they are going to add it in the software. 
it can be very useful if you see that you know it's taken a 10 second exposure but it hasn't added it to the the stack right now you don't know why if you could see the uh single frame single exposure you could see that it has started trailing there was wind whatever you'd be able to figure out the reason i think it would be really nice but it is currently not available that said, this is related to being able to save those sub exposures in addition to the final light accumulated image. And ZW, the maker of this, is apparently working on this. So hopefully we will have the individual sub exposures available as raw fits files for us crazy as photographers to mess with, which is going to be awesome. For casual users, it doesn't mean anything and we're not going to use that. But if you're interested in going deeper into astrophotography, that's going to be a game changer because then you can uh, do that automated stacking yourself and with your own parameters and try to make it better to have better signal to noise ratio and in the end better images than when you can get inside the telescope. But this is really for geeks. Another question that came up uh, often is, can this telescope be used in equatorial mode? So if you're not familiar with astronomy and astrophotography, um, equatorial mode is a mode or a position by which you orient the telescope so that it becomes easier for the telescope to track the target. The tracking can be more precise. And at the same time, it avoids a, a phenomenon that is called field rotation that is always uh, visible when you use a telescope that just moves horizontally and vertically like this one does. Equatorial mode, however, it's quite awkward because what you would be doing with equatorial mode is take the axis of the telescope here, not the lens, the axis of the telescope body itself and point it to the uh, north celestial pole or south celestial pole in the southern hemisphere. And that puts the telescope in an awkward position. There's balance issues. And there's, of course, the fact that you need to align the telescope with the celestial pole manually. So there's more setup time. And so does it have equatorial mode? The answer is no, this does not support equatorial mode. There are no plans to support equatorial mode. This is different from the uh, Dwarf Lab Dwarf 2 Smart Telescope, which I featured on the channel previously, which is smaller and lighter. So it is easier for that scope to support equatorial mode, which it does, and which is great if you're an experienced astrophotographer or you want to go deeper in the hobby. This telescope is really more for being quick to set up without any trouble. You just like plop it down and, and get going. And it's extremely good at that. It is so good at that, in fact, that recently we've been dodging typhoons here in Tokyo. Actually, tonight, late in a few hours, we're supposed to get a typhoon right on upon us. So I haven't had time to image, but when I did, it was like windows of time of maybe 30 minutes, something like that. And I simply was not able to do any astrophotography with my main equipment, but I was able to take that out, plop it down, control it with the smartphone and have fun. Another interesting question that I got from the astrophotography crowd watching the video is, can I fit the filter onto this telescope? Like, in astrophotography, we use filters like this one, which is a light pollution filter. It's actually a dual band uh, filter that is amazing at vanquishing Tokyo light pollution when you're imaging nebulae. And those filters can be extremely expensive. This particular filter, this piece of glass here, cost as much as the whole telescope here. <laughs> so yeah, uh, we astrophotographers, we take care of those filters. We love them, we use them, they're awesome. Can we use it together with this? So there are no threads at the front of the telescope that you could screw a filter into. What I did is that I 3D printed an adapter for my filter. It's a terrible 3D print and terrible design, so I will not share it. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but just like temporarily to be able to put filters on top of the telescope. And then I tried, once I had put the filter on top here, I tried the telescope, how well it worked. And it actually had no issue with very narrow, narrowband filters on it uh, to uh, do autofocus, to go to targets, to center the targets, and to start the exposures. But what I did notice is because the filters restrict the aperture, the amount of light that the telescope can gather, I did not get as much as an enhancement as I thought I would compared to the internal light pollution filter that is built into the telescope. In fact, I felt that my images of nebulae with the uh, my super expensive narrowband light pollution filter were slightly worse 
than the ones made with the telescope natively with the in-body light pollution filter, which was a very interesting result. That said, I have not tried it yet because the skies have not been cooperative enough with some slightly broader bandpass narrowband filters. This is my next uh, step uh, to try out. Another question that I had is how sensitive it is, is this telescope to wind? If you're setting it up in a windy place, is it going to work well? Uh, the answer is it's very sensitive. It's able to kind of wobble fairly easily. Uh, so if you do set it up in the windy place, you should uh, have something to block the wind. Whether you're using your, your car as a windscreen or using like some poles with a, a cloth in between or whatever, I highly recommend to protect this from wind when you're doing imaging. And I have noticed that the amount of stacking time that I get when there's wind is much less than what I get when there is no wind because the telescope is constantly rejecting the 10 second exposures that it is taking because of star trailing. And finally, the last questions that I got about this telescope was what are the dimensions of the case where you fit both the telescope and the tripod? Well, the corners are rounded, so I wasn't able to measure them very precisely, but someone found them on the internet. And I also managed to kind of uh, measure it on my own. On my case, it was uh, 32 centimeters, 32 centimeters and 16 centi centimeters. So pretty easy. There you have it. Those are the dimensions. And this is all for the questions that I had on the ZW Star S50. So what are your thoughts on this? Do you have any more questions? Do you want me to delve more into it and into what aspects? Uh, hopefully when I get some better weather because right now it's really hopeless. Well, let me know down in the comments. So please leave a comment. Please let me know your questions, your remarks. And while you're there, you may want to like the video. It truly, truly helps out. Uh, you can also subscribe to the channel, in which case, welcome to the channel. Uh, click that bell icon to be notified when I make new videos, including videos about the Seastar S50. And I want also to give a huge thanks to my Patreon supporters and my channel members. You guys truly make the channel possible. All of the equipment that I'm using to take this video was bought thanks to your contributions. But more important than all of that, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget, whenever you can, to look up at the stars or the clouds in my case. And I'll see you next time.